Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. 25-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalaya. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you this hour as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off. Ubuntu 32-bit apocalypse. That is what some are calling the situation that we have found ourselves. We're going to break this entire situation down for you. We're going to explain it throughout the course of the episode. We're going to get your feedback. You too can join the conversation at 855-450-NO. We'd love to have you. You can also join us in our interactive mumber room, something we haven't talked about for a while, but it is a higher quality way for you to participate in the show in real time. You can also go to our website, asknoahshow.com. On the lower right-hand corner of the page, you'll see a little call into the show icon. You can click on that. All we ask is that you have a USB style or plug-in headset that you can use on your computer, and you can join the program that way. Whatever works best for you, we'd love to get your participation, your input, and your thoughts on this. So this discussion really breaks down into four parts. What was proposed by Canonical, in other words, their initial plan and the technical reasons behind that and their technical reasoning, the community reaction to that initial response or to that initial announcement, Canonical's response to the community's response, and then where we go from here as we move forward. Let's go to the phones, 855-450. Noah Chaz, you're on the air. Good afternoon. Hey, Noah, how's it going? Pretty good, Chaz. How are you doing? Pretty good, and uh, must have a psychic connection going on, because my first question was going to be, can you give us the two-minute elevator pitch of what exactly happened over the weekend between Canonical, Valve, Ubuntu, Steam? But since you said you're going to do that, I'll skip to that. Um, the, uh, the two questions I had for follow-ons was, it seems like this could all be solved by just distributing Steam as a snap. Right. And uh, I'm wondering if there's something that prevents that or why Valve wouldn't want to do that. And then my second question is, uh, on Linux Action News, Chris and Joe really kind of praised uh, Canonical's decision, and they said that if they, if they felt that if Canonical went back on it, it would be another instance of you know, the outrage mob intervening in a private business's decision. And you know me, you never have to sell me on not caving to the outrage mob, but doesn't it seem a little shooty in the footy to uh, say, hey, we want you to game on Linux, but oh, by the way, the most popular gaming service doesn't right. work on the most popular Linux distro? Right. I, w- I just I, wanted to get your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start, I'll answer in order. So the two-minute elevator pitch is this. Too many people are taking two minutes to try to condense down a very complex and very technical discussion. And they're trying to get it down into a two minute blurb or tweet or something that they can put onto the internet so they can drive clickbait. And I think that in and of itself is a big part of the problem. Uh, Due respect to Chris and Joe. I disagree with them entirely. Um, They're entitled to, to their opinion. I think that it's far worse than just shooting yourself in the foot. It's, it's divorcing yourself from one of the major victories we've ever had on Linux. Now, here to, to throw those guys a bone, if Linux were in a different world, if we lived in a world where Linux was the predominant platform for gaming and Valve had a vested interest in following whatever it was that Canonical did with Ubuntu because they're tied at the hip, and so they they needed to move with the, the direction of the development of software, I might have a different response to that. And in fact, I might even agree with them. You know, at the end of the day, it's a technically superior argument to say that we need to support uh, and have games move to 64-bit. The part that I think, and again, due respect to Chris and Joe, the part that I think they're missing is you have games that have been out there for a very long time. And these games have no hope of ever being updated to 64-bit. And Windows has recognized that. Microsoft has recognized that. And Microsoft being the predominant gaming platform that Valve has worked with for years, if Windows wasn't able to convince Valve and game developers and all of the parties that be to make those changes, there is zeros 
there is absolutely no conceivable chance whatsoever that Linux is going to be able to do that, right? The only thing that that would cause, if, if, if Canonical had stuck to their guns, then the best case scenario is we would have lost a bunch of gamers over to Windows and Valve would have chosen a different operating system to base their gaming platform off of. And quite frankly, that we might still be in that boat. Time Only time will tell if the situation can be saved because of the uh, because essentially of the way that it unfolded. And so I again we'll continue to we'll continue to dive into that and we'll continue to discuss it. And I thank you very much for the call. Uh but um I, I want to start by explaining so that we're all on the same page and we're all caught up in case you've been living under a rock. Canonical announced that they were going to discontinue updates to the i386 platform. In other words, they weren't going to include the 32-bit libraries that many apps needed to run. Now, when I say they're not going to include, not not to say that they were going to remove them entirely from the system. They were just going to drop continued support for the base libs required to run 32-bit applications like Steam and Wine and all the games that run there within. Just everything other than the libraries, basically the same way that Arch had handled multi-lib support. So that's not that's not quite as bad as everybody has made it out to be to begin with. Everyone wants to pretend like Canonical is totally throwing away everything to do with 32-bit, and I don't think that is accurate. The reality is, companies have had years to figure this out. We have had 64-bit architecture, and we have been supporting backwards compatibility for years. And everybody who is still stuck on the 32-bit bandwagon is dragging the rest of technical innovation down. And so to that point, I think that there is legitimate reason for companies to try to constantly test the waters to see if it's an appropriate time to cut the lost causes and move forward. I strongly suggest to you that now is not that time because one, we don't have a cemented foot in the gaming industry enough to be able to, to elicit that kind of change. Nobody cares what we do on Ubuntu. They care what happens on Windows. Now, I get it. The longer that this takes, the longer that the tail is and the harder it is to maintain these things and the harder it is to keep these things moving, 100%. But ask yourself this. Shouldn't the developer be the one developing games with 64-bit in mind? So that kind of goes down that thought path of, listen, it's not really our job to maintain 64-bit or 32-bit architecture. It's your job as a game developer to move for things forward, right? And if, as, a, as, a, as a technologist and as somebody who likes to see technical innovation, I understand that argument and I understand wh that's why a lot of people have reacted the way they have. But the reality is this is very much like the IPv6 thing. We're all standing at this cliff and we're all looking for, we know IPv4 addresses are running out. Just like we know 32-bit architecture someday is going to die a death. And we're all looking around and we're saying you first. Many of these old games have not been updated. And many of these old games will never be updated. And people are religiously playing these old games because it's really fun and that's what they enjoy doing. And so if Linux wants to be usable as a gaming OS, then it absolutely has to make the concession to support 32-bit libraries or people are going to go back to Windows to play those games. And listen, I get it. If you're one of those people that an operating system is just a tool, then I guess that's an acceptable compromise to you to say, well, as long as, this, as, long as we win in this little box and we can check this little box that says that we're technically superior because we have the right libraries and you have the wrong libraries, it doesn't matter that 80% of our user base is going to up and leave us. If that's okay with you, then I understand why you would take the position that, hey, you know what? doesn't really matter. But to me, it seems like this is a really big deal. And you know it's a really big deal because the community has spoken up and said, hey, this is a really big deal. We're really frustrated about this. Now, Canonical points out themselves in the announcement that there are major technical hurdles to be overcome if we're going to continue on this road of dragging 32-bit libraries with us. Not the least of which is mitigation for security hardware flaws, like Spectre and Meltdown. So I am not giving a pass to one side or the other. I'm not saying, hey, doesn't matter what you want to do. If you think we need 32-bit libraries, well, by golly gee, that should be Canonical's responsibility till the end of time to maintain this outdated thing because that's the only way we can get you know, users to come along so they can play their, you know, their retro games. But the initial announcement was hit with a massive 
massive, massive backlash to the point that it wasn't even true anymore. The, the things that were going around the Internet didn't even reflect the initial announcement. And when Canonical came to clarify the announcement, those clarifications were not being reported. It just was kind of, this is the clickbaity thing that we want to talk about, and so we want to complain about it, and so let's make as loud of a noise as we possibly can. Quote, thanks to the huge amount of feedback we've received this weekend from gamers, Ubuntu Studio, the wine community, we will change our plan and build selected 32-bit i386 packages for Ubuntu 1910 and 2004. So let me stop right there and just say congratulations to Canonical for being a good steward of the community and actually respecting what the users want and what the needs of the users are. You made a decision. I understand why you made it. I understand how we got there. But you made a decision. You tried something. And as you figured out, and as 2 points out in the chat room, the internet loves to rage. And so that happened. But as you read the feedback and as you got it, and I, I saw it happen this weekend, I watched developers in Canonical and people in Canonical get involved with other people in the community and experience this together and say, oh, there is a lot of stuff that is broken. And this is not appropriate. And this is going to be disastrous for our relationship with Valve, for our relationship with the gaming community, for our relationship with people that want to redo retro, uh, retro style gaming. But let me ask you this. Quote, the question of support for 32-bit x86 has been raised seriously and discussed in the Ubuntu developer community since 2014. That's how we make decisions. Now, let me ask you this. How are we as a community supposed to respond if on one hand, every time we get a whiff of bad news, people spread FUD like crazy, and that absolutely happened this weekend. At the same time, how are the rest of us who want to do responsible reporting and want to have this discussion out in the open, how are we supposed to know when is something is simply being talked about and simply being discussed and options are simply being considered and when we're close to a real actual decision that's going to break a whole host of things, when is the appropriate time to speak up? Is the appropriate time to speak up every single time one of these discussion comes up on every one of these mailing lists? And are we supposed to have this massive community backlash to say, we don't want this, this is not going to be good? Or do we wait until a decision is actually made, something is actually tangible that we can look at and say, oh, they're actually going to try and do this thing. This is going to be very bad. We better, we better do something about this. Is that not an appropriate reaction? I think the problem is, and we talked about this a little bit on the show in a couple of different ways, this idea of aligning your users and their needs uh, and, and, and making that cohesion where a company's needs and a user's needs are in line. And I think this may be an example. I'm not saying it is. It isn't. I'm just saying it, it may be an example of where a company's need to, to make itself more profitable so that it is sellable as an IPO doesn't maybe perfectly align with what the user's needs are. Let's face it, as it, as it relates to Canonical and as it relates to Ubuntu, the 10% of desktop users and an even smaller percentage of that that are using Ubuntu as a gaming operating system is completely inconsequential as it relates to Canonical's profit goals. Really doesn't matter in the, in the, in the big scheme of things. Now, it matters a lot if you're the person that wants to use Ubuntu to play your games. And by the way, that person is not me. But money is being made by Valve. Money is being made from the product of Steam and the games that are sold there within. And so if you're trying to sell yourself as a reliable platform and a reliable alternative to Microsoft Windows, then you absolutely have to take into consideration the needs of that particular software platform. In this case, Steam and all the games that go with it that would run on Linux except for the fact that we're going to dump all these libraries. That's a problem. I, where I am left with, with this entire situation is I am quite frankly terrified that the relationship and the reputation between Valve and Canonical is irreversibly damaged. And I say that because according to the blog post, or according to the, um, the, the uh, announcement from Canonical, Valve was in on this conversation. And to be clear, we did extend an invitation out to some employees at Canonical, and they know that they have an open invitation to come on the program and, and discuss this with us. Um, I understand that they're busy. I understand that there's a lot going on. There's 
a lot of people that want attention from Canonical right now. But I have to admit, it's a little hard to believe that they're in on this discussion and, and Valve is able to create pressure to convince Microsoft to keep 32-bit libraries on Windows because Windows wouldn't shoot themselves in the foot like that. And somehow the Linux community got the impression that wouldn't be a big deal. Valve, up until recently, has recommended that gamers run Ubuntu Linux, the most popular desktop Linux distribution, and now it would appear that this might be changing. And I think that is that should be taken very seriously. Now, this all stemmed from a tweet from a developer at Valve who announced that Ubuntu Linux 1910, which is due to come out in October, won't be officially supported by Steam. And Valve is said that they're going to continue to support Linux, just not Ubuntu specifically. So it kind of, it, I, I guess, again, from the outside, not being part of the conversations that, uh, you know, undoubtedly took place, or I'm told took place, without being privy to those conversations, I'm left with the outside appearance of, if Valve was in on this conversation, they either didn't do a very good job of explaining that, hey, this is going to break a lot of stuff, and we're going to pull official support for your distribution if you do this, or Valve themselves wasn't aware of the, the, the ramifications of this. Or there was a miscommunication in, in trying to explain to Valve what Canonical's plans were. Going forward, what Canonical says they're going to do is they're going to try to push packages like Wine to make use of snaps or other container technologies running 32-bit software in the future. Now, the problem is nobody really sees Valve going down that route, My, to include myself. I think that... If you're a developer at, at Valve, the concept of packaging up all of your stuff into snaps to ship out may be a little far-fetched. And hey, you know what? I think it would be great if we could make that work. I think it would be fantastic if we could arrive at a place where Valve is actively working with container technology because it would future, quite frankly, it would future-proof all of the games that they're shipping on Linux. So I think it would be great. I just don't see it happening. I would like to ask you to consider why Valve made the decision a couple of years ago to abandon Windows and try out the waters of Linux, understanding that Linux is a community-developed operating system that doesn't have the built-in user base that Windows does, that doesn't have the support infrastructure that Windows does, that they don't have the pre-existing relationships that Valve had with Microsoft, Ask yourself what it was that Valve saw in open source and in Linux and why they wanted to make such a big investment with such a seemingly little return on the face of it. And if the answer you come to, which is the same answer I came to, which is they wanted to feel more secure in their platform, they wanted stable ground under their feet, they wanted to be more comfortable with the platform that they're tied to the hip to, then I want you to ask yourself where you think we are left with the trust in the pavement under our feet after this last go around. Because, hey, you know what? There is, there is absolutely the possibility that we know large portions of this have been blown entirely out of proportion. And Canonical uh, maybe hasn't done as good of a job as they maybe should have at explaining exactly what they intended on doing, why, and the ramifications of those actions would be. But... Maybe it, it is all just essentially a misunderstanding. The problem is, worst case scenario, Canonical is making decisions to do what they need to do to make their company more profitable, to move the technological needle forward. All of the things that work great in cloud and work great on IoT, but aren't really in the best interest of the desktop user, aren't really best interest of the gaming user, aren't really best interest of Valve and Steam and the gaming community at large. So I give props to Canonical, I do, for turning the ship around once they realize this impending disaster. But this, all of this stuff breaks on Friday, which to, to, to throw, again, a bone to Valve, they probably didn't really have, or excuse me, Canonical, they didn't really know that this developer was going to tweet all this stuff out. Be that as it may, they make this announcement, all of this stuff blows up on the weekend, and then there is all sorts of Twitter rumblings that, hey, it's the weekend we are not responding to this stuff right now. We will get back to this on Monday. And I think that impression, and I'm sure that there were people working behind the scenes and working behind, you know, behind closed doors, all of that kind of thing. 
But I think it's perfectly reasonable for us as users and us as a community to expect a multinational $500 million plus dollar company to respond to a PR disaster on the weekend. Okay. That's not asking too much. Interestingly enough, this leaves a lot of other distributions in an interesting place because now Valve is searching for a new home. Carl from System76 sent out a very definitive tweet that basically said, hey, we split from Canonical, we split from Ubuntu because we were concerned with some of the directions that they were going. Now we find ourselves at an impasse yet again with the direction that Canonical is going and we have to make a decision, but I want you to know we are going to continue to support the gaming platform outright. And if that means that we have to hire full-time developers to maintain this 32-bit library thing, that's what we're going to do. One way or another, we are going to deliver this experience to our customers. And you know what? I've been pretty hard on Pop! OS. Since day one, I've been pretty hard on Pop! OS. I said, it's not for me. I don't understand what they're doing. It basically seems like a theme on top of GNOME. And every, every couple months a little something else gets added in or a little something else gets twisted. And I have to look at it and go, hmm, well, that's interesting. I understand if you look at the backside of the way that they're doing some of these things, it's maybe not what some people would expect. The way that they go about incorporating drivers, the way that they incorporate getting software, I get all that. But at the end of the day, if you are a dumb new Linux user and you sit down, the experience that is delivered from Pop! OS is a better experience than the experience that comes from stock Ubuntu. And I get it. There's a bunch of legal reasons. There's a bunch of practical reasons. There's a bunch of technical reasons of why that is. But at the end of the day, I was talking with uh, with Jason from Forbes, and he, was, he told me the same thing. He said, listen, when I sit down as a new user, this is a better experience for me. And so where that leaves System76 is in a really interesting position because now there is a fundamental need and a large company that wants to base their gaming software off a particular platform, a platform which System76 is now beginning to maintain on their own. And it, this has just kind of come through by storm. And I understand that there have been people in System76 that have been working throughout the weekend to try to, to try to get all of this stuff sorted and situated so that if push comes to shove, they're in a position to continue to maintain these things. But it makes Pop! OS a more valuable operating system, much more valuable than it was back when they made the split, right? And you, you, you couple that with the bundling of Lutris. You couple that with the built-in restore functionality. You couple that with the fact that you can buy hardware directly from System76, from people that actually use this stuff and care about this stuff and work with this stuff. And all of a sudden, you start to understand how this really underscores the reason for the split and you start to understand why people believe that Pop! OS is the best distribution for new users of Linux. 855-450-NO, it's 855-450-6624. Cubicle Nate in our interactive mumble room. Hey man, welcome into the program. Cubicle Nate, do we have you? Okay. All right. Well, if you'd like to speak up, just... uh. Holler at me in the chat room. We'll we'll put, put you back up. We'll go to the phones. Eight fifty five four fifty. No, that's eight five five four four five zero six six two four. Rodney from Denver. Thanks for hanging in there, man. Well, welcome to the program. Hi. Hey. So I've got a what? It's probably going to be a pretty easy one. Um, I've got a server in a DMZ on my LAN, and I want to add a couple more web services to it. Um, but I've only got one port 80. Mm -hmm. uh, and ideally, I don't really want to enter, um, you know, colon, port number. Um, yeah. So I, I just, I want SSL. I, I don't know if I need a droplet to get a second IP or something like that. No. So I just, uh, ideally, I would like to just use my home IP because these yeah. are just for me. For my e easiest way to go about that, Rodney, is just to use uh, uh, Apache Virtual Host. So essentially, an Apache Virtual Host looks something like this. When a connection is in, let's say your IP, it's not, but let's say your IP is 1.1.1.1. And so you create an A record for mynewsite.com and you forward that A record to 1.1.1.1. Let's say right. I, uh, let's say I come through and I say, Rodney, I would like you to host asknoahshow.com. And you say, well, I've only got my single IP address. I don't know what I'm going to do. I say, okay, Rodney, I'm going to, we're going to go ahead and set up this Apache virtual host thing. I'm going to point my A record for asknoahshow.com at your same IP address, 1.1.1.1. Now, 
when you get a when your server gets a request for a for a um for a website and you and, and your server comes in and says okay i want asknoahshow.com the apache virtual host even though it's the request is coming into that same IP address because the request is asking for asknoahshow.com. It will serve one website. And when you go to mynewsite.com, even though that a record is pointing to the exact same IP address because it's requesting mynewsite.com, the Apache virtual host is going to deliver it an entirely different website. Um, and so in that way, you can have a single IP address, a single server and have multiple sites running on that exact same server. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. 855-450. No, it's 855-450-6624. I think we got our issues in the mumble room worked out. Hey, Cubicle Nate, welcome back into the program. Hey, how you doing? Hey, pretty good. I understand you had some thoughts on the uh, canonical uh, conundrum. Well, I was looking at the uh, at, at my system since I do have Steam, but I'm running OpenSUSE, and there's 250 32-bit packages mm -hmm. that my system has pulled down, and I, I've, I have lots of... Uh, I have lots of cruft on my system I could probably clear out. But but I'm thinking, though, if just the base libs themselves, is it that much additional work that they couldn't maintain those 250 additional packages? And, and, and why not pulling in the community more to, to help with that process? I know some other distributions do. Yeah, I mean, it, to a certain degree, it gets a little complicated, right? Because they have to start having that that community then have access to a bunch of backend stuff so that they have so that those libraries are available to pull down in the official repositories and all of that kind of thing. The, the the real question for me is, is the juice worth the squeeze? And I I have yet to hear a compelling argument as to why the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Why we would why would we allow all of these games to not run on Linux because we don't want to maintain antiquated architecture. And I get it, it is antiquated architecture, but is that not what we signed up for when we said that Linux was going to be the next gaming platform and we were going to be a viable alternative to Windows? Isn't that what we signed up for? I mean, it's it's part of the reason I do use Linux. It 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 keeps my old hardware going a little longer, and uh, it's there's a sense of security in using it. Sure. Even, even if it's uh, even if it's just a, a make believe security, it's it, there's a sense of I have ownership over my system. I can run whatever I want on my system and. I don't know. I, I've been running uh, 32-bit. I still run. I, I have Tux Cart, mm -hmm. uh, not, a Tux Racer. I'm sorry, in a in a box set that I bought in 2003, and uh, you know it'd be, be kind of sad to lose all that. I don't know you can get the get newer stuff now, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I just I, I I'm just surprised that they would make a move like that. I mean, it, it, that's all. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it is surprising, and I thank you very much for the for the comments. I, I guess my thought is what ended up probably happening is they had this discussion quietly, you know, behind the scenes for quite some time. Nobody really threw up a fuss. All of a sudden, they decide they're going to move forward, and the internet erupts. And when the internet erupts, the first thing I ask is, is there any actual validity to these claims? And what I found was, in this particular case, it's about half and half. Half the people are just spreading misinformation. Half the people haven't even bothered to read what's actually happening. They're just kind of making it up as they go along. And then the other half of the people are trying to downplay it as if this is no big deal. And it's, it, you know, there's like, ah, there's one or two games that aren't going to work, but uh, we didn't need them anyway. And that's not what makes Linux su successful. And, and again, I guess that depends on, on, on how you're approaching it. 855-450 NOAA, is it, is it BR Radio? Is that right? Am I pronouncing that right? Welcome into the program. Hi, Noah. Hey. Uh, uh, nice to calling you again. Uh, I have a question about LAC. I will have a new system. Okay. And I want to full this, do a full disk encryption with LAC. And I was thinking about having something like a, a key file and a password or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that I, so that I can give a key file to a friend and the password to another friend. So if something happens to me, they they need to bo both come together and and encrypt my system, mm. something like that. Um, let's see here. So what I would, I mean, that's uh, what you're describing. Are you tr are you describing a recovery method, or do you want actual two factor? That is to say, do you want a backup way to for somebody to recover your Lux encrypted volume should something uh, you know untimely happen to you, or are you saying you want to make it more difficult for anybody to include yourself to access that Lux encrypted partition? Uh, a little bit of both. 
I like to be uh, as secure as possible and to have, uh, but that another person is able to uh, do it anyway, hmm. like a trusted person. Well, let me let me start with this. If, if since you since you phrased the question as two factor, let me tell you what I would do if I wanted to do full disk encryption with two factor. I would use something called the YubiKey. It's a hardware two factor authentication device. And there is a project called YKFDE, that is YubiKey Full Disk Encryption. And it enables you to use the YubiKey for, for two-factor authentication for Lux. And so the password you enter is used as a challenge for the YubiKey, and then the key script allows it to boot the machine uh, with either the password and the YubiKey or with a normal password uh, on, on any key slot. And so uh, that would be the most straightforward enterprise supported commercially available non-hacky way to accomplish uh, two factor with lux now there there are a couple ways you could do it right you could also do it with a pam module and you could have a pam module then talk to lux and then authenticate that way and that would enable you to use any sort of pam device you wouldn't be uh, you know married to one specific brand um, so if that appeals to you, that might be another way to look at it. But if it's me and I want just pure two factor, I, I would do something with with two factor and Lux. And as far as if you wanted to let somebody else have access to that system, you could either share with them the location and safekeeping of your two factor device, which, to be honest with you, kind of defeats the purpose of two factor because. The whole idea with two-factor is something you know and something you have. But I guess in this case, we're talking about disaster recovery, and we're talking about if you're no longer here and to make sure that the data is still available. Um, the the other way you could go about that is you could, in fact, enroll two YubiKeys. You could give one to your friend. You could keep one. Both of you would share the password, but each of you would have your own, uh, you know, two FA to 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 decrypt that drive. That'd be the other way you could you could tackle that. Does that yeah, answer? That's yes, about right. Yeah, that's yes about right. It's uh, it's hard to me uh, for me to get a YubiKey here in Argentina, but yeah, I, I can't think I can get around it. Well, I I tell you what, I tell you what. Here's what we'll do. Uh, it's it may be hard for you to get a YubiKey in, but I, if you if you can hang on with me, I'll put you back on hold. And what I'll do is I'll have uh, Sarah pick up and get down your particulars, and we'll send one out to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Just hang on hold for uh, for a minute here, and and Sarah will pick up and, and get your particulars. Make sure to give her your address, and uh, and we can get a YubiKey sent out to you. I think I can do that more cost effectively than it would be for you to try to obtain one. Again, the phone number eight fifty five four fifty Noah eight five five four five zero six six two four. That is the that is the phone number to be a part of the program. The email live at asknoahshow dot com. The Raspberry Pi four has been announced, and oh my gosh, is this amazing! You can simply drop your new Raspberry Pi into your old projects and upgrade because, of course, they have kept the size and form factor and all those things very similar to the past form factors and size. In fact, all of the software is backwards compatible. So this is a major upgrade for those of us that are in the Raspberry Pi world. Now, the processor probably got the biggest performance increase. It is now a quad-core processor running at 1.4 gigahertz. They are sporting not one, but two dual HDMI 4K monitor outputs. This is going to be massive, absolutely massive, because it, it actually enables real desktop work. You're going to be able to actually, you know, do some stuff with this thing. They're also including three different models, a one gigabyte model, a two gigabyte model, and a four gigabyte model. Uh, Type-C power, which of course goes to the top of my list of things that are awesome, gigabit ethernet, and a Raspberry Pi PoE hat. So a little circle board you can put on the top and then you're able to power the Raspberry Pi with PoE. Now the one gigabyte version goes for 35 bucks. The $45 version goes for, or the, excuse me, the two gigabyte version goes for $45 and the four gigabyte version goes for $55. I tried to order the four gigabyte version. It was sold out. I tried to order the two gigabyte version. It was sold out. I tried to order the one gigabyte version. It was sold out. So you're going to have to wait at least if you're ordering from Adafruit. All of them are out of stock at the moment. But this is a massive, massive improvement to the Raspberry Pi. And frankly, the Raspberry Pi started as a learning device, but with Type-C, dual displays, 4K, gigabit Ethernet, 4 gig of RAM, I could see this absolutely being a small desktop replacement in some limited use cases. And I'll give you one example right now. We are looking at adding another computer here into the studio. And uh, what we want that computer to do is just control some of the equipment. So there, it's all web-based configs. It's all web-based control panels. Um, we just need something to always have those video control things up. And uh, we started pricing out what it would cost. And it's like, 
man, we could totally do this with just a basic computer that runs runs a runs a a, a a web browser. We don't actually need a full functioning like i5 or i7. And wouldn't you know it, 48 hours after we're having that discussion, we look at this and, hey, guess what? The new Raspberry Pi 4 is out, and it's incredible, and it is literally a desktop replacement and could be a desktop replacement. So we are, the second they're available, I'm going to buy one, and I'm going to try to use it in production for the first time ever. I think this really signifies a, a shift for us because for a long time, we have seen these as just learning devices. And I'm wondering, with the introduction of PoE, with the introduction of USB-C, with 4K, two 4K outputs, is this now a general computing device? Is it to be used in embedded applications? Scale runs a massive conference with FOSS devices flashed as APs. How long before somebody creates a you know, a Unify controller that has FOSS software and you can flash each one of these Pis and use the Wi-Fi chip as an access point or something like that? This is also kind of cool, too. As we were kind of researching this and, and I was kind of learning about the Raspberry Pi, the entire Raspberry Pi website is run on a Pi 4 server cluster with 72 cores, 72 gigabytes of RAM, and it consumes less than 100 watts in a half U rack space that retails for under 1000 bucks. So they tweeted out, server manufacturers better start getting scared because the reality is the Raspberry Pi is coming to eat their, their dinner. And uh, it's a cool device. So this will be the first time I've said for a long time, I've been pretty public about it. Hey, I don't think the Raspberry Pi is really meant for commercial applications. I think it's a great learning tool. I think it's a great experimentation tool. I think it's something that you, you can you can kind of play with a little bit. I wouldn't be comfortable running it in production. Do you know what? We have gotten to a point where now I think I would be comfortable running it in production. It's been around a lot. It's established itself. I think it's time that we we move forward with it. Speaking of Raspberry Pis, we had a chance to catch up with Ruth Seeley at Red Hat Summit, and she is doing some amazing, amazing work with Colab, introducing young girls into the art of open source and technology, but more the community aspect of what open source is. Here's that audio. Ruth, thanks for taking the time to sit down with us. We appreciate it. I, I guess let's start with the basics. What is Colab? Why is Red Hat involved? And what are Red Hat's goals with Colab? Colab is a project we started about two years ago out of our brand activation team, not to talk about products or anything like that, but simply to teach the very basic principles of open source to middle school girls. And the reason that we talk to middle school girls is because many studies show that about sixth grade is when you start losing kids, particularly girls, in their interest in STEAM. Really? Yeah. Uh, 11 or 12 years old is really kind of the sweet spot. And we've actually seen, as we've worked with a little bit younger girls and a little bit older girls, we have sort of our own firsthand evidence that that really is kind of true. That 12-year-old spot is really where you get their attention and their interest mm -hmm. and they're really passionate about what they're doing. And so the reason it's called CoLab, we're teaching them collaboration. There are plenty of code camps. We don't need to generate another one of those. And so that's what we want to teach them is just collaboration. So our first project, we taught a curriculum where we built Raspberry Pi cameras. And oh, cool. Yeah, and so that really put the A into the STEAM, the art aspect. Mm -hmm. So the girls would spend a day building the cameras, and I would show them the code, teach them kind of how it would look if you were writing code, but not actually make them do the coding themselves. Right. And they would put together the camera, and then each group of girls uh, in different cities, we've done, I think, nine cities now, would have a poem, and they would go out and take pictures with their cameras that they built based on the poem and how it inspired them, and then build an art project out of their photos. Awesome. Yeah. And I really liked the, the art aspect there, putting the, that piece into the steam. The curriculum we're doing now, which we have at Summit, I brought you this so we can show you, the collab girls that we taught in Minneapolis are here. They were on the keynote stage at Red Hat Summit. Wow. They did an amazing job. They wrote a song for us. They came and really? sang their song. It was awesome. And so they're in the expo hall teaching people what I taught them the first morning that they came. And what we do with them is a very basic circuitry curriculum. Mm -hmm. They build a little copper tape and LED circuit. It looks like this. And there's a little battery Look at in that. here. Yeah. And so they learn the idea of a positive line and a negative line and how a battery works and light up a page. And so what we do is we had a writer in Boulder who wrote a short novel. Mm -hmm. It's about 68 pages, eight and a half by 11. But the final book is about eight inches thick because they illustrate the pages first with these copper tape LED pages. And then in the afternoon, I teach them to use what they've learned about circuits and build another set of pages with a lily pad Arduino. 
And so some of the pages shake or they make sounds. Some of them light up in different ways. And, and the, the, the individual students are choosing which one of the results happen on these on these various projects? Well, so each page has a, a an intended result. Oh, I see. OK. They get to decide where on the page things go. They have to design their circuit and build mm -hmm. it. And in some cases, it's more obvious than others. A cell phone might say, the text might say, she pressed the 5 on the cell phone. And mm -hmm. so in that case, you know you want your button to be on the 5. In other cases, <laughs> There's a little more creativity involved, and they kind of have to decide how they want to do it. As those of us that are deeply involved with technology, I think sometimes we forget that it has a real impact on human life. And there are lives that are changed, and we make these connections. I would imagine working with these girls, you, it must have had an impact on you. Talk about that. My mother was a teacher. I never envisioned myself as a teacher. Actually, when they first asked me about teaching this collab curriculum, I thought middle school girls. I, I don't. <laughs> sure. I'm not really sure right. about this whole plan. And now I, I can't believe that I would ever have any doubts about these girls because of exactly what you're saying, the impact that we see at the end. We see them on the first morning. They come in and they sit down. They look terrified. They're very quiet. They don't want to talk to us. And if you can imagine a pack of 11 or 12 year olds being quiet, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what they're going to do. They don't know how to do it. And I say, all right, so here's why we're here today. And by lunchtime today, you are going to know how to build your own electronic circuit and light up a light. And they all look at me like, I am completely insane. And then they do it. And they get that first sense of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And then we go through the rest of the curriculum. And they've built this whole book together. And they've made it work. And they really get this amazing sense of satisfaction. And then we get these little thank you notes from them. And then they tell me things. Uh, we send them home with a basic, the copper tape kit, so that mm -hmm. they can go make their own project when they get home. And I had one girl tell me, I can't wait to take this home, because my dad's not going to believe that I know how to do this. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, yeah, I think lots of girls have gotten that message over the years. I, I, so let's dig into that for a second. When you first said that, I thought that was a great thing. I thought, That's great that she's excited, and that she's going to show, and that she's going to impress her parents. But actually, as I'm thinking about it and kind of processing that, that is a sad message, isn't it? That that there are girls that would go home and believe that their dad wouldn't believe that they are capable of it. So I guess the question I would ask you is, do, is there a difference if you took a 12-year-old boy and he came home with a with the with a circuit that he made? Do you think that would that would go over, uh, be more expected? And is that a problem that we face in society? Oh, certainly, and and that's part of why we're losing them at 11 or 12 years old is because girls even in 2019, are starting to get that message that, that this is a boy thing. And that's why all of our mentors are women who work in technology in some way. They're not necessarily developers. And mm -hmm. so uh, I'm, I'm not a developer. I'm, I can edit some code and <laughs> write some very bad code, but that's not my day-to-day -day job. Sure. I actually have a degree in journalism. Mm -hmm. I just came at this all sort of sideways. Uh, and so we have women showing them, you can work in technology. If this interests you, that's OK. You don't have to sit at, stare at a screen all day writing code. You could, uh, we have people on our brand team who maybe made a backdrop like this, mm -hmm. built the room, who wrote our curriculum, who wrote the story. There are lots of ways that you can be involved in technology if it interests you. Uh, and we haven't taught the class to boys. We do have, the curriculum is all on GitHub, so anyone who wants to go reproduce it can do so for sure. anyone they would like to do it with, whether mm -hmm. it's one kid in your house or 50 in a class, whatever. So I don't have that same analog experience with a classroom full of boys. Mm -hmm. uh, all I know is my, my own personal experience growing up. I had a wonderful supportive family who never would have said no to anything that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I did sit at the Commodore 64 and type out basic code, because sure. that's how old I am. But it was because I had magazines that told me I could do that. Mm -hmm. My brother had a very different experience growing up with computers and the sorts of TV shows and movies that he was encouraged to watch and things mm -hmm. like that. I, I think that we still are not intentionally treating boys and girls differently, but there is something that happens, and girls still get this message. We give little girls dolls, and we give little boys Legos. Mm -hmm. And so they're building something, and little girls are taught to make something pretty. I gave my little girl Spider-Man, but yeah. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, so you're, you're ahead of the curve of, of parenting. Charlie Resinger has an interesting one-to-one -one, uh, Linux program. And his idea is to put a laptop in the hand of every child so that every child can appreciate that laptop. And when he first did it, people looked at him like he had three eyes. Because he said, I want every child to have root access to this Linux-based laptop. Whoa, are you nuts? We cannot be giving small children root access to a computer. He said, let them screw up. Let them break it. And then let's fix it, and let's teach them, and let them learn about technology. Do you feel that we need a stronger emphasis placed on early exposure to technology and, and more trust put into kids to play with the technology and learn it? Oh, absolutely. So one of the things that we say in open source all the time is release early, release often, or more colloquially, fail early, fail often. We have, we have to give people permission to fail, give per people permission to not be right the first time. 
that is a fundamental part of open source, that it's okay to say, here's what I'm working on, how can we make it better together? And that's one of the things that's difficult to tell the girls in a collab class is that it's okay not to know how to do this. It's okay to get help from the person sitting next to you. It's okay to do it wrong and then we figure out how to fix it. That, that all of that is a part of how we do things differently and that that's okay. Um, oh, I was also going to say, so I do like Charlie's program. He has a great program mm -hmm. and something else that I've done, I mentioned the first collab curriculum was Raspberry Pi based and I co-authored a Raspberry Pi book and so I've talked to a lot of people about Pis. And parents initially, so back when the Pi was fairly new, mm -hmm. parents were kind of terrified of it. You know, what's really? my kid get? Oh yeah, I would talk to parents at Maker Fairs. We did Maker Fair Bay Area in New York and several others, and they would say, my kid wants this thing. I don't know what it is. Is something terrible going to happen? What would, I mean, I'm just curious, like, did anybody ever speculate? To, I mean, it's only $35, so I think we can assume it probably not a money thing. That's exactly it. That's entirely what the Pi was designed for. So the reason it's called the Pi, a lot of people don't know, is because it was intended to teach kids Python. And so that's what I tell parents is, actually, this is the solution to all of your concerns. Yes. You have a computer at home and you don't want them <laughs> to right. break that? Give them this one. And if something goes wrong, you reflash the SD card and yeah. you have a whole new computer. It's okay. but. For, we, we live in a technical land, like all of our yes. friends, probably you, like me, most of the people you talk to during the day know what Linux is, know that this isn't a problem, but parents whose main technology interaction is with the Roku to turn on the TV show or their laptop at work, they don't, they don't realize that, they need that information. My generation, when I was looking at technology, I would go look into, I would go into a store and I would look at what I could purchase to create something, to put things yeah. together, right? And, and that led me to getting licenses as a ham radio operator and all those kinds of things. What I see my children doing is walking into a store to see what they can walk out with. What experience is this piece of technology going to deliver? Not what experience can I create? Mm -hmm. What can we do as technologists to inspire that, that ability and that natural desire I think children have to want to create things? I would love to see people building their own computers again. I, there's a lot less of that now. Even I, I think if I needed a new computer today, I would probably just go right. buy one off the shelf. Whereas sure. 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, I went, like you say, I bought the mm -hmm. components. There, were, there was this great website I've forgotten the name of that would tell you uh, that it was constantly updating prices of all the components and we could watch and wait until that processor was cheap enough to mm -hmm. buy, you know? Uh, and so that, again, is part of what the Raspberry Pi was designed for because even uh, five or six years ago, kids showing up at college wanting computer science degrees had no idea what was inside their computers. They didn't know what a processor looked like or what the RAM was doing in there. Like, it was just a magic box that did things for them. So yeah, I think it would be great to get uh, hardware components into the hands of more kids again, let them see from the bottom up what goes on inside. Let them open up their laptop. I mean, modern laptops are pretty easy to mm -hmm. tinker around with. You really, you almost can't do it wrong. If it fits, it probably went in that hole. <laughs> once in a while, the... <laughs> that could lead to some broken stuff. <laughs> <laughs> once in a while, the magic smoke comes out. Right. Your mom's going to be really mad. But I mean, there are tons of tutorials online. Uh, I know one kid who is making a, a small enterprise for himself. He's about 12 years old uh, out of fixing people's broken phones. Really? You know, yeah, he'll go order the glass on eBay and because people are afraid of technology. Absolutely. Yes. They, I mean, they, don't, they, they can't even change the battery in a phone. That's the world we live in. Which and is I, a whole other set of problems. Absolutely, yeah. It's a thousand dollar phone that you can't change the battery. It's crazy when we say it out loud, but that's the world we live in. There's an interesting dynamic in education, and I think you're upsetting it. And that dynamic is that we must have a teacher that sits at the front of the room and projects out to students in grid seating. And not every child learns that way. We know not every child learns that way. What can be done uh, and what can we do as technologists to help children uh, learn differently and experience technology differently? I have a pretty great school system. My kids are fourth grade and seventh grade. And when you describe the classroom that you and I mm -hmm. no doubt had of that grid style. And, and my seats, kids have too. That is not what my children have. And it's so awesome. amazing. And the first time I went in my daughter's, my older child, mm -hmm. went into her kindergarten class for the first time. And I was like, is this, is this what classrooms look like now? And it <laughs> is for us. So for example, and I, I think that the things that our school district has done have been really great. So for example, she in about fourth grade was really easily distracted. And uh, you know, in a lot of cases, it, it's a story that many of us are familiar with, many of us nerds, where you know, the schoolwork got boring and you didn't oh, have yeah. anything left to do. And, and so her teacher worked out a deal with her. She said, you just have to finish your work and then you can go sit. They had like a restaurant booth style mm -hmm. set up in the back of the room. You can go sit back there and draw, do an art project, make whatever you want. You just have to do your work first. 
And I love that idea of being flexible enough to, yes. to meet the child's needs, even in a classroom of 30. But not compromising what the, the work that needs to get done. Right. We don't just let them run rampant. Right. We, they, they achieve the educational goals, but then once they've done that, um, then they're free to experience and, and move on beyond that. And I think we ha we're so focused now, uh, at least in North Carolina, and I think a lot of places on teaching to the tests, they have to do their integrate exams, and the importance is on what those scores are that it's easy to neglect a lot of other things and teach to the easiest way. The easiest way is the way that we grew up with. I stand in front of the room and I teach to a bunch of you, but I think we get a lot further when we have the flexibility to meet everyone's needs while making sure the work gets done. Nobody gets distracted, but everyone gets to learn in the way that they need to. One of the things I've always respected about you is you don't you don't conform to 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 any massive system, right? Even though you work for a company as large as Red Hat, um, you're out doing ground level work and and grassroots type stuff. How can other people that are listening to this and they're going, I'm listening to what Ruth is saying, and I think that's fantastic. How can I start that? How can I do those things in my community? It's all about finding the things that you're interested in, and it doesn't have to be software. It's not all about technology. We can change the world in whatever it is that interests us. And so if for you, your passion is in gardening, then there are so many community gardening projects now. If your passion is in education, it's okay if you're not a technologist. Go find a way to be passionate about the education in your community and finding a way to make a difference. So as you know, I, I helped launch opensource.com years mm -hmm. and years ago. And in the beginning, we didn't talk about technology at all. It was all about how the open source principles work in so many other ways, how they work mm -hmm. in education, how they work in the legal field, how they work in businesses and healthcare and all of that. There are ways to apply those principles. That's why we're teaching the girls in CoLab collaboration, because you can collaborate with other people and make the world a better place no matter what you're doing, whether it's software or hardware or completely not technology at all. It is fundamentally a better way to work. You touched on this a little bit. But Red Hat, every Red Hat employee I talk to, I never get the impression from any of them that open source is a brochure filler or that it's a line or a tagline or something that they're told to say. It's a core belief mm -hmm. to everybody that sits down and chats with me about Red Hat. Um, as a person who's worked for Red Hat for a long time, what does open source mean to you personally? For me, it is those functional ideals, those basic principles that I keep talking about, the collaboration, the, the release early, release often, rapid prototyping is a mm -hmm. perhaps better way of saying it. All those things that make open source a better development model for software make a better way to run our business. And that's why you hear that from Red Hatters, because they see that every day. It can be a little jarring at first when new people come in and have never had that experience before mm -hmm. to work in a place where anyone can say, what are you doing? I think I have a better way to do that. Like, that can be a, a really jarring experience. Mm -hmm. We have, I think a lot of people are familiar with Memo List. Uh, it is, if you are not familiar, a list where anyone in the company, you are automatically subscribed, you cannot unsubscribe, and anyone in the company can say anything whenever they want. That doesn't exist a lot of places. <laughs> What was the aha moment? Most of us that are in this industry, we didn't start out in open source. I know I didn't. I started out in a proprietary setting, proprietary software, doing proprietary things. And over time, came to see the advantages and, and the belief system that is open source. For you, what was that aha moment where you went, that's a better way to do it? Uh, I, I would like to say that there was a magical aha moment, but I maybe came in a little bit different way. So for me, my first encounter with Red Hat was pre-Fedora. It was Red Hat Linux back mm -hmm. then. And uh, although I was a journalism major in college, I was working on websites. I was building websites for fun or for a department, whoever needed one. And this guy who lived upstairs in my dorm said, have you checked out this Linux thing? Like <laughs> slid a CD across the table. And that, I mean, that was it for me from the beginning. And of course, in the beginning, I think like it is for a lot of people, it was the free as in beer, yeah. you know, especially when you're a college student. Right. I certainly didn't know that contribution was an option until many years later. And so that was one of the things when I first did start getting involved in more Fedora stuff, that's one of the things I wanted to do is tell people that there is a way to be a part of it, to, to contribute, to participate, no matter what you do. If it's documentation, if it's design, whatever it is you want to be a part of, there's a way to give back. But you, so you get this CD and you put it in your computer and you're maybe running, I assume, Windows at that point if, as a journalism. Yeah. So you, you put the CD in and everything is different. And is there something that sparks in your mind and goes, wow, that's really cool that I didn't have to pay for this and it's quality software? Is that, was that kind of what, what started it? You know, I'd like to say that it was that magical, but uh -huh. so this was late 90s, I guess. Sure. And at that point, Growing up, there was always a new computer system. Yep. So there was that, okay. there was that early Commodore 64 I mentioned, yeah. and then my dad would bring home the 8088 and then the 286. Yep. And 
you know, Windows changed a lot. 3.1 was so different, and I had seen, uh, oh gosh, what else was going on back then? All the there was the Windows NT. Was that the, mm -hmm. the networking? Well, one? you know, late '90s is when we started to see ME and 2000 come out and stuff like that. So I kind of like I totally overhauled. missed ME. I checked out of Windows about that. Okay, good, good. You. <laughs> I hear it wasn't really great. It wasn't. It wasn't a great experience. Well, Ruth, thanks so much for taking the time to sh sit down and chat with us. Thanks for everything you're doing to help these kids move forward. Uh, would love to get you back in the program soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. 1-855-450-NOAA, that's 855-450-6624, the email live at asknoahshow.com. Just a couple of minutes left in the program. Hey, if you haven't uh, checked out linuxdelta.com, we invite you to do so. And a huge thank you for the appreciation for everybody that has been submitting their feedback at linuxdelta.com. Now, if you're not familiar with Linux Delta, you missed the announcement. This is our community hub to help people connect and share their experience with various Linux distributions. Applying the same free and open source principles that a community that allows things like the AUR to function, as well as it does, the same principles that allows things like Amazon.com, B&H Photo and Video to be a resource for people to learn and experience uh, various products without having to buy them themselves. I told the story when we made the announcement. I was in the store purchasing a vacuum cleaner, and I did my research on Amazon.com because I knew... If there was a vacuum cleaner that was highly rated on Amazon.com, it was also going to work well for me if I bought it in the local store. And so if you're a distro hopper, we need you. We need you to try distros. And when you try one for a desktop or a server IoT, make sure to stop at LinuxDelta.com and let us know what you think of it. If you're just joining us for the first time and you have friends that are maybe getting into Linux, send them over to LinuxDelta.com. Let that be a resource for them. Help us spread the world. It's your one-stop resource to discover the best distro for you. Hey, that's it for this hour of the Ask Noah Show. We'll be back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. If you want more content, AskNoahShow.com. We'll see you next week.